namo tassa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arato samma sambuddhassa Hi, my name is Venerable Sister Kima. I am a Samanary nun, Buddhist nun, and I am from the Buddhist American Forest Tradition, which is located in the United States. I've been a nun for about six years, and I have been studying for about 12 years with Most Venerable Vimala Ramsey. We call him Bhante Vimala Ramsey, or Bhante. And over the course of my studies, I have decided I really want to uh, do a series of talks for just anyone to understand the, uh, the truth of the teaching of the Dhamma. Um, I call this the reweaving of the Dhamma cloth, finding the tapestry of truth. The truth that we are trying to uncover is basically that which sets you free from suffering. Uh, I think we have to start probably by talking about the Buddha. We don't need to go back into the whole story, but the curiosity for me is that I always wondered as a Westerner, what did the Buddha do? How did he do it? Are the instructions still here today? And if they are, can you and I find those instructions and do the same thing within this lifetime? And if we can, the big one is, is it valuable for our life right now? Can we reclaim the pricelessness of Buddhist teaching? First, we have to look at who the Buddha actually was. And I don't mean in terms of him being a prince or in terms of the Sakyan clan. I simply mean as a teacher, who was he? He was a meditator. You know, I was a personnel consultant for a number of years before I was a nun. And we always said if someone has done a profession for a long time, he becomes an expert if he's done only that profession and nothing else. That's how you become an expert at something. In this case, the Buddha was a meditator, and he was a meditation teacher for all about 45 years. As the master researcher of truth and uncovering what this suffering was, he went to two different teachers. He studied with Alara Kalama for a number of years during the six-year period when he was with the other ascetics, and he got to a certain point in his meditation called the base of nothingness. After that, he left Alara Kalama and went to study with Ramaputta. And when he studied with Ramaputta, he got to neither perception nor non-perception. But he knew there was more. He knew he could go further than that. And so he kept on searching. Now, I think we need to stop here for just a moment and say, what was the suffering? Did he define exactly what the suffering was? If we look in the Majima Nikaya in number 141, we will find very clear definitions of all of the tiny pieces of suffering which are mentioned in the Sutta texts. The phrase that I'm referring to is sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair. And in this Sutta, the Satcha Vibhanga Sutta, 
the exposition of truths. This is in Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, which is what we use for the Majjhima Nikaya, the middle length sayings. And this book, this Nikaya, the, there are four Nikayas, and this Nikaya, uh, it stands as the one Nikaya that has the complete teaching in it. It is supported by the Samyutta Nikaya, which is the supportive, shorter uh, types of suttas supporting the same thing found in the Majjhima Nikaya. The other two Nikayas are the long discourses, which is the Digga Nikaya, and then the Anguttara Nikaya, which is the numerical sequence uh, Nikaya. For our purpose today, I just want to look briefly at what he said, uh, this sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, and despair actually was. He said, and what, friends, is sorrow? The sorrow, the sorrowing, the sorrowfulness, the inner sorrow, the inner sorriness of one who has encountered some misfortune and is affected by some painful state, and this is called the sorrow. What, friends, is lamentation? It is the wail, the lament, the wailing and lamenting, bewailing and lamentation of one who has encountered some misfortune or is affected by some painful state, and that is called the lamentation. And what, friends, is pain? It is bodily pain, bodily discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feeling, born of bodily contact, and this is called pain. And what, friends, is grief? It is mental pain, mental discomfort, painful, uncomfortable feelings born of mental contact. This is called grief. And what is despair? The trouble, the despair, the tribulation, the desperation, the anxiety of one who has encountered some misfortune or who is affected by some painful state, and that is called the despair. So what, friends, is not to obtain what one wants to obtain? That is called suffering. So this is when the suffering is basically if we take it down to one tiny phrase or word, we can say it is dissatisfaction. That is what the suffering basically is. So the Buddha, actually, he made a journey to try to figure out if people could relieve themselves from suffering. There were many, many key groupings of information that had to do along the path to understanding the relief from suffering. Uh, there are the three characteristics of existence, which are key in understanding this. Anicca is the word that means impermanence. Our, we are dissatisfied by the fact that things cannot stay permanently the way we want them to be. The suffering we already spoke of. The last one is called anatta, anicca, dukkha, anatta. These Three pieces are very important in uncovering them and seeing very clearly what precisely they are in order to understand how the suffering works and how to get free of, from it. Now, anatta has often been translated as no self, but for my own part, I found this extremely frustrating and not clear at all. And I think many people that have been my students and my teacher students over the year have also found this to be a bit complicated. But, you know, if we look in the suttas at what was said about uh, this anatta, it is the idea of personality. And personality is not, it doesn't mean your personality, the way we talk about he has a nice personality, she has a nice personality. It's, it's different from that. What it basically means 
is not the identity of the person in that way. It means that you identify with everything that happens to you. You see, your experience in this world happens through this body, which goes from your head all the way down to your toes. And within this body framework, you have a psychophysical situation between mind and body that is operating. And that is how you experience your existence. Now, you experience the external world through the eyes, the ears, the nose, the tongue, and the body. So these five sense doors experience the forms that you see, the sounds you hear, the odors you smell, the flavors you taste, and the tangibles that you touch with your body and experience the sensations. Then you have a sixth sense door, and the sixth sense door is your mind. Mind experiences what they call mind objects, or dhammas, which arise. And these mind objects, in English, is very simple. The eye has forms, the ear has sounds, and the mind has mind objects. This is the way they translated this. It makes sense because the contact that leads into the experience of this existence happens in this way. The eye will first see, for instance, color and form. So if I see color and form, and then eye consciousness arises, the meaning of the three, make eye contact. What says glass is perception. Now I'm talking in terms of the five aggregates now, because you are made up of five aggregates according to the Buddha. Your body's the first one, feeling is the second one, and feeling is either pleasant, painful, or let's just say for now it's neutral. We're just going to deal with the pleasant and painful mostly as I teach you in this series. So you have the body, you have these feelings, and they come one at a time. You have perception, which names things. And when we did this with the glass before, we said the eye meets color and form. Eye consciousness arises. The three pieces make eye contact. And what said glass was perception. So perception has memory in it. That's how it works. So we have body, feeling, perception. Then we have thoughts, which arise on their own. And we have consciousness. Consciousness cognizes. It cognizes the experience. Without con consciousness, we cannot experience perception. We cannot experience feeling. The feeling, perception, and consciousness are conjoined together. They coexist. You can't perceive without feeling and being conscious. You can't feel without being conscious and perceiving. You can't be conscious without feeling and perception. It's an interesting little trick with these three pieces. Okay, so that's how we basically experience our existence. And then we heard that the suffering is our dissatisfaction with what happens, with what goes on in our life. So how do we get tired out in a day? It's simple. What happens is I might, for instance, um, see something with my eye, making contact, and with contact as condition, feeling comes up, and let's say it's a painful feeling, and I don't like it, and then I want to make it stop, and I get preoccupied with trying to make that feeling stop. That's called craving. And as I begin to crave with, I don't like this, then I say, I don't like it because, and the story goes on in my mind about why I don't like what came up. And then I'm preoccupied, and I have moved away from the present moment. You see, in your life, you have the past, and then you have the present. I'm sorry, you have the past, and then you have the future. In the middle is the present. That's where we are. But what happens is, so many people carry around all of the emotions and traumas and sadness and grief and distress that happened in their past, that they happened in their past, they're carrying it on their back. 
and their future worries are sitting right here in their front and they are worried about what might happen next. Because of the stress of getting upset over emotions who are from the past and worries about the future, we don't have much energy for right here, right now. And this is one of the reasons we get so exhausted because we'll play this game of I like it, I don't like it. I like it, I don't like it. And this gets us internally upset and distressed and we lose all our energy for living each day. But stop for just a minute and ask yourself, what is true about the past? The past is gone. It is not here. It is fixed in time. It cannot be changed. And the future, what's true about the future? Well, it is not here. Um, we do not know what it is going to be. And the question is, do we want to put energy out to something that we don't understand what it's going to be, so why should we worry about it? And yet, if I were to give you one cup of energy every morning, what would happen to you is, you would most likely take one third of that cup and you would give that energy to the past and take one third of this cup here and you would give this to the future. And then you'd try to live your life on one third of your energy and you would get very tired, I promise. So <laughs> what we have to do is take off that backpack of the past and take off this front pack that you have on the front and just put it down on the floor. I give you permission for one week to just put it down on the floor and leave it there. Now you can take all of your energy and put it into this moment right here, right now, while we are talking, while you are doing a task, while you are spending time with the person you would like to spend time with. So this is what the Buddha was doing. He was actually trying to figure out ways similar to this, of letting go of stress in the wrong places and tension and tightness, letting go and coming back to the present moment and putting all our energy here in the present moment so that we could learn to think clearly. But there were still some problems, still some problems. Now, the Buddha said that we are the happy ones. And what did he mean by that? Well, we are the happy ones. We can be the happy ones when we understand, when we have a trained mind, when we understand how things are working and how we can release the tension and relax and smile and be happy and stay in the present moment. If you want to understand what happens to you when you grow older, you need to visit a daycare center <laughs> and you look and see the vibrant uh, just energy that flows out of the two-year-old. The two-year-old child is curious about everything in the world. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't project or think about what it might be or worry about what it was yesterday. He's discovering everything. Once we have established this information base, things start to change inside us. And by the time we're older, we've decided instead of spending our times vibrantly alive like that, curious about everything, we've decided to carry things around on our back and worry about things in the future and drain our energy out. And this just doesn't work. This is not what we need to do. Now, the Buddha was a master meditation teacher. And, you know, I was a personnel placement counselor before I was a, a nun for almost 14 years. And I have to tell you, whenever we found someone with a lot of experience in one particular thing, we looked very carefully at him to see if he had become an expert. Because the way you become an expert is to do something and do it all the time and eventually you will get very very good at what you are doing. In this case the Buddha was a meditation teacher. He was a meditator and he was a master researcher 
into trying to figure out how to do this and once he figured out how to lay out a plan to set people free from suffering then he spent 45 years teaching that same topic anyone who teaches something for 45 years you can pretty well believe that that person has refined the way he teaches it and has simplified it now it's interesting because in a lot of the traditions the buddhist traditions no matter which ones you look at they all seem to have one particular chant that is been preserved and is used within those teachings that chant is the chant that says the Buddhist teachings was easy to understand it was immediately effective and it was so interesting it invited inspection more inspection more inspection and you wanted to learn to see how far it could actually go so this is why it's been so exciting for me in this to see how the things that the Buddha were teaching have are able to help people today just as easily as they helped people in ancient times when he first found this now I want to just read a little bit for you of to give you an idea from the text what it was that the Buddha was doing when he was teaching this is from the Div Divedavitaka Vitaka Sutta the two kinds of thought we're using Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation uh, from the um, wisdom publications and it's available through amazon.com it's probably available at BPS here in Sri Lanka it goes like this thus have I heard on one occasion the Blessed One was living at Sowati in Jetta's Grove Anathapindika's Park and there he addressed the bhikkhus thus bhikkhus the venerable sir they replied and the blessed one said this bhikkhus before my enlightenment while I was still an unenlightened bodhisattva it occurred to me suppose that I divide my thoughts into two classes then I set on one side thoughts of sensual desire thoughts of ill will thoughts of cruelty and I set on the other side thoughts of renunciation thoughts of non ill will thoughts of non cruelty and I abided thus diligent ardent resolute a thought of sensual desire arose in me I understood this is a thought of sensual desire it has arisen in me and it leads to my own affliction to others affliction and to the affliction of both it obstructs wisdom causes difficulties and leads me away from Nibbana now what does what does he really mean there it leads to my own affliction and to others afflictions when it was a sensual desire the thing that you need to understand at the core of the teaching of Buddhism is that it isn't that the Buddha is actually asking you to simply give up life and he certainly is not asking householders to do this he is asking you to help yourself become free from suffering by coming into more balance with understanding the um, I like it's and the I don't like it's and say you can still see a beautiful rose and experience the beautiful rose and smell the odor of the beautiful rose and like it and then leave the, Buddha, the, the uh, beautiful rose and move on in life. The key to the Buddhist teachings for the lay person especially is to say once something has happened that's over now we can go on. We can go on with our full cup of energy, we can apply it in the present moment, we can do whatever is needed to be done, we can do that with a clear mind paying attention with balance and equanimity this is what we are struggling for equanimity and balance the Buddha was teaching uh, a way of letting go of reactions and of learning to respond and in order to respond we have to 
begin to smile and to let go. Let go of the tension and tightness of wanting to make something stop because all things will arise. All things will pass away. We know this is a natural law. All things are impermanent. So we can allow something to be happening and it will arise, it will occur, and it will pass away. If it needs a response, instead of reacting the way we always have before when stimulated with a similar situation, we let go of that. We look at what is happening and we learn to respond. Very quickly, um, an example of the um, difference between a reaction and a response. I've actually had people ask me this. Uh, there once was an office and it had many people working on it and in uh, one of the trash cans there all of a sudden someone had thrown something in there and a fire started in the trash can and one secretary started screaming and yelling, it's an emergency, we have to get out of here, everybody run out, leave the building right now and everybody did that. This was a huge reaction and she ran out of the room and another person stood up, looked at the trash can, went to the water fountain, got a glass of water, brought it back and poured it on the fire and took the can out of the room. So one person reacted and one person responded. So the question is, what would the world be like? What would the world be like if we actually took the time to be calm and to respond and not to just react. That's the real question, isn't it? So I'm going to leave you today with one, one note that was in this uh, sutta, a little bit ways in, that we use all the time. It's something that you ought to just print out and put it up on the wall. The Buddha came and he said to the monks, what you frequently think and ponder on, that will become the inclination of your mind. So when you get up in the morning, if you are not smiling, when you get up in the morning and you dive into feeling really bad, then you're probably going to feel bad all day. But if you look at what knowledge you have just from this one talk, whatever arises, passes away. So why get uptight about it? It's the truth. It's there. It has a cause, a reason for it happening. So we say, okay, it's there. Does it need a response? Or can I relax and let go and relax? and can smile and wait and be patient and not take things personally. The Atta and Anatta perspective is something we will talk about in our next, uh, in our next little talk. This one I will say thank you for coming and I enjoyed being here for you and I hope that I can do many more. Thank you. <laughs>